Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stian Thorgersen. I'm the project lead on the Keycock project and I was also one of the co-founders of the project. Uh, today I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to various different features and capabilities provided by Keycock. Uh, but let's start with a really quick introduction about what Keycock is. So Keycock is aiming to be very simple to use, ready out of the box and allowing you to authenticate users and securely uh, invoke REST APIs and microservices with little to no coding. The way that it works is that when an application wants to log in, uh, the, the authentication is then delegated to Kiko. Kiko will then provide the, the login uh, screens. The Kiko will store all the users. Kiko will save all the passwords securely and a huge number of other things. Um, once the user has authenticated with Kiko, the uh, user is now redirected back to the application and the application will now op obtain two different tokens. So one token that allows the application to establish authentication of the user uh, and another um, token that the application can use to securely invoke REST APIs and microservices with full end-to-end -end user authentication context. Keycog is also able to pull in users from a number of different uh, sources. Uh, you can federate users from an LDAP directory, from an Active Directory, or your own custom user store. Uh, Kiko can also delegate authentication to other identity brokers, be it through OpenID Connect, SAML, or Kerberos, uh, as well as a number of different social networks like Google, GitHub, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, many more. For the purpose of this demo, I have a number of different containers up and running. Uh, I have my Kiko container running, I have an LDAP server running, I have an example application running, and finally I have a little mail testing tool running. The first thing I'm going to do as part of this demo is to log into the Kiko admin console. The Kiko admin console is a very extensive um, nice to use uh, console that allows you to manage pretty much everything about Keycock. The first thing we're going to do is take a look at realms. So realms is like tenants. Um, each realm can have a isolated sets of clients and users uh, which are all sandboxed from each other. Um, within Keycock it comes with one default realm called the master realm. This realm should be used only to secure Keycloak itself, while for your own uh, applications, you should create a new uh, realm. So let's do that for this demo. Let's create a demo. And I'll also give it a nice, uh, friendly, readable name as well. Now that we've created our demo, I want to register my application into to the realm so that the application is now allowed to authenticate uh, with Keycloak and with this particular realm. I'm going to call my client JS console and I need to, since this is a single page application, I'm going to have it as a public type, which means that the application itself can't securely authenticate with Keycock. So we need another way of establishing trust or reducing that this can't be abused. And we'll do that by specifying a valid redirect URI. This means that Keycock will never redirect uh, anywhere else with uh, the information uh, and tokens needed. This is, since this is a single page application, we also need to allow it to be able to do uh, Ajax request uh, to Keycock to be able to obtain new uh, tokens and, and so on. Uh, and this is why we're configuring a web origin. The next thing we're going to do is to configure uh, email sending uh, because we we'll want to demo this, this throughout the, the, the demo today. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set an email address for um, the current user that I'm using to manage my Keycock instance. And then I'm going to go back to my demo realm. And now I'm going to use my uh, little uh, testing tool for, for email, which is running on demo mail uh, on my uh, Docker local network. And I'm going to say that emails come from Keycock. Now I should be able to test sending email and here we go. And I'll just quickly check that I actually got a test email and we did. 
and let's get rid of this old email there. All right. So now that we have configured SMTP, um, let's now, um, instead of having the admin go in and create all the users, let's, let's have the users self register. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to enable this option in the realm to allow users to then self register with your realm. I'm also going to require users to verify their email address. Um, because I want them to have a valid email and you'll see this uh, towards the end of the demo. Why, why this is important for me in this case. Right. So now that I have allowed users to self register and I set up the client and the realm, I can now open my example application. My example application requires login. So it will immediately redirect to Keycloak when I'm, um, I'm opening the application because I'm not already logged into it. So I don't have an existing user, so let's register a user. Let's use my name, for instance. And of course, this registration form is completely customizable. You can add and change what details you're asking from users. And you can obviously also change the look and feel of, of this form. Now, since I asked users to verify their email address, this is the next thing I'm going to have to do. So I'll go to my um, my test mail server, and here's my email that asked me to click on this link to to verify my email. And once I've clicked on on the link, my uh, email address is verified in Keycloak, and I'm immediately logged into the application. Right. So now. Let's add a little bit more information about this user to the system. What I'm going to do, I'm actually going to go in through the admin console and I'm going to add a new uh, attribute for the user. I'm going to call it avatar URL and I'm going to paste in the link for the Keycloak logo as my avatar. Now, Keycloak is aware of this attribute, but I need to also pass it to, to the application. And the way that I do that is by registering a client scope, which has a mapper which is able to then add additional information into the tokens passed to, to the client. So I'm going to create myself a new client scope. I'm going to call it avatar URL. Hang on. And I'm going to create a, a mapper uh, into this client scope. So I'm going to take a user attribute. Uh, the user attribute is called avatar URL as we created before, and I'm going to put it in with the same name in, in the token. It's always going to be a string. And let's say I want it into the ID token, but I don't want it into the access token. The ID token is a token that the application uses to establish the authentication of the user, while the access token is the token that is used to invoke microservices. Um, and let's say that microservices do not need to know the avatar, uh, only the front end application needs to know it. So we'll do it this way. Now, I also need to control that this JS console application that I created before is actually allowed to use this client scope. So I'm going to add that as a default client scope. You can also make them optional, which allows applications to incrementally ask for consent. And uh, we'll see uh, clients asking for consent a little bit later. Now I refresh my tokens and now I've got a avatar. So how did the application be able to do that? Now it did it by looking at the ID token and the claims, which is called with inside this token. Uh, we can see here now we have things like we have the name of the user, a given name, family name, preferred username. We have the email address. We know that the email is verified and we also have this avatar URL link as well. So this allows the application to know information about the user. It also has the access token, which it can pass to uh, microservices so that microservices can know uh, information about the user and whether or not the request should be permitted. All of these tokens are obviously signed or encrypted. Uh, when they're signed, this allows applications and services to, to, to trust because they can verify it based on, on the keys uh, provided by the uh, Keycloak server. And we can see here that there is no avatar URL in the particular access token, while there was one in the ID token. 
Now, let's up until now we kind of made the assumption that this JS console application was an internal trusted application. Now let's say it's a third party application, in which case we probably want users to consent to any uh, anything that they give this application permission to, to do. So let's enable consent. And if I now log back into this application, <coughs> Keycock will now ask me if I grant access to these various different things to my application. Um, I see here I'm not really happy with it displaying avatar URL in this way, so let's go back and quickly fix that. Uh, I'll find my avatar URL and I'll uh, give it a consent screen text, so I'll call it user picture. Let's refresh the page, and there we go. Now it's asking for user picture, user profile, user roles, email address, and so on. Okay, I'm going to allow this particular application access to these things. And here we go. Right, so I'm going to disable consent again, because I don't want to have to keep consenting throughout the demo. And now I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about roles. Um, Keycock has a concept of roles, so roles allow obviously to assign roles to, to uh, users and which can then use, be used um, by your applications uh, for role-based access control. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, basically we'll just call, create a role called user. And I'm also going to create a role called admin. So let's just imagine that a user is a regular user of applications, uh, while an admin is a administrator access. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add these roles to the user. So let's say that this particular user is both an admin and a regular user. And now I'm going to go to my uh, client and I can actually control what roles and permissions a particular uh, application is allowed to, to receive as well as what is added to, to users. So the roles that will now be available in the token given to the application will be the union between the roles that the user has and the roles that the application is allowed to use. So I'm going to say that this particular application is only allowed to access the user role. So any uh, microservices that require the admin uh, role, this application is not allowed to, to invoke those microservices regardless if whether or not a user with those roles logs in or not. Now let's refresh our uh, tokens again and let's have a look at our access token. We can see here that the Realm Access has the roles user but it doesn't have the role admin even though that particular user had it. Now if I give the uh, application access to the admin role as well, I can now refresh my token and I can see that now I have the admin and the user role. If I now go back to my user and I uh, remove the admin role from my user, then I refresh my token and I can see that now we're back to just a user. So it's the union between the two. The next thing I wanted to show you is that Keycock also have concept of groups. Um, Groups, uh, a user can uh, belong to multiple uh, groups um, and each group can have uh, child, child groups, it can have attributes assigned to it and it can also have roles assigned to it. So I'm going to create my uh, group, I'm going to call it just my group and then I'm going to add a attribute let's call it um, user type and let's call this user type is a uh, regular user with a lack of anything better. Um, let's also say that any um, user that's part of this group will get the user role. And then let's go to our user and I'm going to take away the user role and now instead I'm going to join this group. Now, groups are not added by default to um, the token, nor is this new user type um, 
attribute that we created. So I'm going to create a an, another kind scope. I'm going to call it just my scope and I'm going to add a mapper. So I'm going to say I want group membership. I'll just call this group so that I can have a nice friendly way of remembering this. And I'm going to put that into the token claim uh, group. Now I also want to add a another user attribute into my token. Um, and I want to do the user type. And again, I'm going to be using a string. I'll just add it to the ID token and the access token this time. And then I'm going to quickly go to my client and I'm going to give that also access to this uh, client scope. Now, if I refresh my token this time around, I can see in my access token, I now still have the user role, even though that user doesn't have a direct membership on that role. I can also see that we have the group, my group. And I cannot find my user type. So let's quickly try to figure out what's going on there. Maybe I did a little mistake. So I forgot to save the form probably. So call it regular user again. Add that, save it. Let's just double check. Yep. And now let's go and refresh our token quickly. And there we go. Now we have the user type as well. Right, so the next thing we we'll take a look at is importing users and syncing users from LDAP. Um, so what I'm going to do as I'm registered a new LDAP provider uh, with Keycock, which is another source where Keycock will federate users from. I'm going to make it writable, which means that Kiko can both read and write to it. So if a user wants to change their first name and last name through the Kiko account console, they can do so and it will be written back into Alda. Um, I'm going to paste in the URL and my user DN. So if you have used uh, Alda in the past, this will be mostly understandable to you. Uh, if you haven't, this will be a little bit slightly Greek, unless you're, of course, Greek, then uh, it'll be Spanish or Chinese or something. Uh, but basically, you won't understand it unless you're used to LDAP. Now, um, I'm also going to want to uh, say trust email, uh, which basically means that any users from this LDAP directory, I'll just trust that uh, the email is correct. And now I can save this. So... I'm going to synchronize all the users from this LDAP directory into my Keycloak directory um, by clicking on this button. And we can see I have now two imported users. So I'm going to go and look at my users and I can see now I have this user that self-registered before, as well as these two new users from LDAP. And I can also see that, you know, the, the email is verified for these users. Now let's try to allow users to log in to our realm uh, from GitHub. I'm picking GitHub because GitHub is actually the one where it's easiest to register on the GitHub side, what we need to do. Um, on the Keycock side, it doesn't matter. It's as easy as just adding a provider and passing in a client ID in a secret uh, for, for GitHub, for Google, for Facebook, for all of these. It's a single quick configuration thing to add these things. So let's go to GitHub and create ourselves a new application. So I'm just going to call it Keycloak Demo. Um, for the callback URL, I get that from the Keycloak server itself. And for the home page, let's just call it the home page of the Keycloak server for lack of a better thing. Uh, and then register our application. Now, if I go back to my application and I log out, uh, actually, let me let me do one more thing before we do that. I actually want to register it in Keycook. Um, so client ID, I need that, and a client secret. This is how Keycook communicates securely with GitHub. I also want to trust emails from GitHub. I'm assuming that GitHub is verifying email addresses. And now I also want to pull in the um, avatar from from um, GitHub as well if, if the, the users have one configured. So this is an attribute importer 
uh, it's put in as avatar URL in the token from GitHub and we'll put it in as the user attribute uh, avatar URL, which we used before. And now we can go and we can refresh the page and now we can log in with GitHub. There we go. So now I'm logged in as a user that is logged in through GitHub. And this is my GitHub, um, well, my example GitHub users uh, profile uh, picture. Now, I briefly told you before that Keycook allows you to configure and customize the, the login screens and the registration forms. So how do we do this? Well, that's done by uh, creating a custom theme. A custom theme can contain style sheets, it can contain images, it can contain uh, custom HTML templates. Um, so you can do quite a lot of configuration and changes. So let's just take a look at one example here that I have. So if I now change the login theme and I refresh my login page, I get this really lovely, cool new theme. Um, so maybe let's change back because it was a little bit horrible. Right, so that's pretty much how easy it is to, to adapt the, the Keycloak uh, end user facing uh, web pages uh, to, to match your corporate branding uh, and, and so on. <laughs> now, I'm going to show a little bit about uh, how Keycoke um, signs tokens and how we allow you to rotate your public and private keys for, for your realms. Um, I'm going to do this by using a little token validator tool that I have. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the actual base64 encoded version of the token uh, this is how the actual token is sent to, to the application. This is basically three JSON snippets, uh, which are independently base64 encoded with a dot in between. So this first part is a header. The middle part is the token claims and the last part is the signature. So now if I copy this, paste it into my little tool that can now uh, analyze this token, it will show me here there's a header which contains this information and there's the payload. And finally, it's check it, checking that the signature is valid. It does this by fetching the public key from Keycloak and making sure that uh, the signature is correct. In this case, we can see that the algorithm used for signing the token is RS-256. Now, let's imagine that we want to change this to using ecliptic curves instead, which is to have a similar security property to RS-256, but is uh, less CPU intensive. I can do this by going and changing my default signing algorithm uh, in Keycloak. Now that I've done this, I don't have to log in and log out again in the application. All I have to do is refresh the tokens and now the new tokens that I receive will be signed using a different algorithm. So now you can see that this new token is, is uh, signed with ES-256. This allows me to seamlessly change the algorithms used for, for the realm and also as well for individual applications. More importantly here, um, this mechanism of allowing you to, to seamlessly update your tokens allow you to also rotate your keys. So it's a good practice to, on a monthly basis or by monthly basis at least, to rotate and create new keys for your realms. You can do this automatically or you can do it manually. Uh, in this case, let's do it manually. Um, I'm going to create a, a new key. Let's call it my um, key two. I give it a higher priority than the one that had that before so that this now becomes my new active key. Um, and um, I am going to save that. So now I can see that I now have two um, keys with different priorities for um, ES-256. I can now go back into my application and I can refresh the token and let's copy the new value. So if you carefully look here at the header, there is a field called KID. This is the key identifier. Uh, so let's see, this one starts at R3S at the moment. Let's paste in the new refresh token and we'll now see that this is now signed with another one. The same 
happens to any cookies that Keycock sets and anything. So the, the, the signatures of all these things are seamlessly uh, rotated as long as those keys remain available. So Keycock will also allow me to um, have both passive and active keys. So imagine that I now say that this key that I created before, I don't want to have it active anymore. This now becomes a passive key that allows it. It can be used to validate signatures, but it can't be used to create new signatures. So if I look at my active one, I will have gone back to my original key for my active key, and I will have gone to use this new key is now my passive key. Right, so let's now take a little look at how Keycock allows you to manage sessions. So Keycock supports single sign-on as well as single logout, but it also allows you to remotely log out uh, applications. Uh, users can themselves log out uh, applications remotely and administrators can also log out sessions remotely. So in this case, you know, we're gonna go back to our application and we're gonna see, yeah, we're still logged in, we can do stuff. And what I'm going to do now, I'm gonna go and find my user. And let's see what user we were logged in with. That was the Stian. Yes, that's the right one. So let's take a look at the sessions. I'm gonna say, well, I'll log out this session. So now if I try to do something, I'm uh, logged out. I can also uh, go and log, uh, look at all the sessions in the system. I can log out all the sessions uh, and so on. And of course, as a user, I can go to my account console and I can look at uh, where I'm logged in and I can log out uh, sessions from here as well. Another thing we can also do in Keycock is that we have support for events. Uh, when a user log is in or when a failure occurs or when an application obtains a new token and number of other things, there's an event generated in the system. Um, you can create your own custom event listener that does whatever it wants with these events, but you can also save these events to the Keycock database and you can have them uh, expired and removed after a certain amount of times to prevent your database from being clogged up with events. Now, right now, since I just enabled saving events, it won't be available in the system here. But if I now uh, try to log in with a bad password a couple of times and refresh this, now we can see that I've had two invalid login attempts. I can see the username that tries to log in and a lot of other information about this event. I can also, as a user, Um, I can look at my own events. So if I try now as the admin, then I can go to the account console and I can look at, hang on, that's the wrong realm. Um, let's go to the account console for the correct realm. There we go. Now I've got the account console for the Stian user. I'll have a look at the log. I can see that I logged in. Let's try to log out. Let's do a failed login attempt. And there you go. So now I've got the various different events that happen to, to my account. Um, yeah. So, okay, the last thing we're going to take a look at is we're going to play a little bit around on how we are authenticating users in Kiko. We do this by creating a new custom authentication flow. So I'm going to take the, the authentication flow that's currently being used. I'm going to create a copy of that. So I don't want to use the username and password for anymore. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I don't want to use OTP anymore. So I'm going to get rid of that. We could have also left that in and we could allow those to be optional uh, alternatives for the users to configure. But in this case, I want to just get rid of it. And I want to use this little um, custom authenticator that I have deployed for this demo, which allows you to log in via a special link sent an email. I'm also going to say I want uh, this to be required. And I also want a user to use a web Auton security. And I'm going to say this is required as well. So 
I'm going to now register a required action that allows a user to self-register a web button device. And then the final piece of the puzzle is that I'm going to change across to this new custom authentication flow. So now if I log out, I can see that my login screen has completely changed. It doesn't ask me for a username and password anymore. It only asks me for, for an email. So let's pass in my email. It says view email. So let's look at my email. I got an email called login link and it has a special little link uh, which allows me to automatically log in. And as I said, I wanted the user to use a security key as well. So let's register a security key. And there you go. I'm now logged in through email and web button. And I can, of course, if I wanted to, I could go and say, I don't want to use web button anymore. Um, if I now log out and log back in again, then I'll get a new login link. And this time I wasn't asked for web button. Right, so that was what we wanted to cover today. Obviously, there's lots and lots of more features and capabilities and things to find out about Keycloak. Um, so go and check it out on our website. It's uh, keycloak.org. You'll find links to our user mailing list there, how you report any issues, if you have found some bugs, um, and how you can contribute to the project if you want to. The demo that I've shown today is available on GitHub. All the different container images are there. There's a step-by-step -step readme that allows you to go walk through everything that I showed today. Um, this is this link. And finally, the Keycloak source is available on GitHub as course. It's open source. Uh, and also do try out our new uh, getting started guides that allow you to get started with Keycloak on various different uh, areas or platforms. Uh, and we will be building out on these getting started uh, guides going forward. That was it. So please go and check out the project. And thanks.